Okay, friends, uh, thank you for coming, and I thought it'd be fun to talk about uh, the Bible. We're doing the Bible and, so the Bible and uh, how we pray, how to pray, and so on. Um, I've thought about this over time, and sometimes I hear people talking about prayer, and the way we often talk about prayer isn't replicated in the Bible, kind of oddly, right? So, uh, just simple things like the idea of a prayer list. Not that a prayer list is a bad idea, but it's not the kind of thing that's ever mentioned in the Bible. You have a list of, and you offer the, like when Jesus says, <laughs> Jesus withdrew to a solitary place to pray. Like, you know, did he have a list of the people he'd seen in Capernaum or something? That's not a thing. Uh, you have the Garth Brooks song, Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. The Bible just doesn't talk a lot about whether prayers are answered or not, right? That's kind of like, I think it's a pretty American phenomenon. I've tried to read other people in other cultures. You don't see that. So it's like we want prayer to what? We want prayer to work. Does prayer work? C.S. Lewis wrote a great essay that I read back when I was in college that was really enlightening. Because the title of his essay is, Does Prayer Work? And I was sort of a cynic at the time, and I thought, mm, if it works, it does not work very well. And C.S. Lewis uh, wrote that it's just the wrong question to ask, does prayer work? He said, prayer is togetherness. It is a relationship. It is intimacy with God. It is a quiet time of sharing. It is thanksgiving. It is all these other things. That's interesting. Uh, I hear people, Christians today, talk about prayer warriors. That's not a bad thing to think that there are prayer, the, the word makes me a little nervous, warriors. Uh, that's not a Bible thing either. Um, so, that it, interesting. Anyway, uh, the things that people pray for, children learn to, pray. I should ask you this question. When children are little, what do we teach them to say in their prayers? So that's a scary one. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die, you don't want your children thinking every night, I might die tonight. That's scary. What, what do we teach children? What, what are prayers for children? Well, the Lord's Prayer. We'll get to the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, yeah but what do they say to God? They, they, they pray, for, they, we're supposed to, I guess, give thanks for things, but then also we pray for, like, protection, help, grandma's sick, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, interesting. Um, stuff that's actually in the Bible is, um, I want to start with Genesis and go all the way through the Bible, and that'll take us, you know, four days which would be great. But I've been struck by this over and over. At the beginning of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he says this amazing thing. Uh, he says, I do not, ch chapter one, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And then he explains what he is praying for his friends in Ephesus, right? And here it goes. Rem remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe, according to the working of his great might." Paul's not praying for somebody to feel better or to be protected or anything. He's praying for knowledge of God, right? He's praying that you will understand the depth of who God is and that you will be wise and so on. It's kind of interesting. Uh, if you want to pray for your pastor, that would be, I would take that uh, all day long. Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says what? Pray without ceasing. It, do we want to talk about that for a minute? How would one pray without ceasing? Paul can't mean like 24-7. He knows you got to sleep, you got to eat, you got to work. What would that mean to pray without ceasing? That what? As you go through the day. It's like trying to remember to say something prayerful throughout the day. 
Anyone else? Keeping God on your mind. I loved uh, Dorothy Day, the great saint of the last century. Later in her life, Robert Coles, the sociologist, was interviewing her. And she'd written an autobiography earlier in her life. And so he said, I want you to go and write some autobiographical thoughts and bring them back to me. So she went away for two weeks, and then she came back. And he said, well, what did you write? She said, I didn't write anything. She said, all I could think of was how fortunate I have been to have had Jesus on my mind for so long. I, that's just like Jesus on my mind. I've often tried to think of the praying without ceasing as, um, I've told some of you this before, as having a traveling companion. Uh, I've traveled some in my life alone. And, um, you know, if I don't travel with Lisa... I eat when I feel like it. I eat what I feel, all those things. <clears throat> but having a traveling companion is cool because as you travel wherever you go, you could say, oh, look, or oh, wasn't that lovely, or whatever. And to think of maybe God as your traveling companion as you go through the day uh, might be something like praying without ceasing. Uh, let's go to uh, Genesis. Uh, in Genesis 3, God has a conversation with Adam and Eve. They, they speak back to God. Is that prayer? Anytime that you say something to God. Uh, God speaks to Cain after he's killed Abel. And Cain speaks back to God. He says, am I my brother's keeper? Like, is that a prayer? Right? If you defend yourself conversationally uh, to God. Uh, I love uh, in Genesis uh, Pages are not one to turn right. Genesis chapter 18, uh, God reveals to Abraham that God plans to uh, destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, But Abraham stood before the Lord and drew near and said, Will you indeed destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then destroy the place? God says, you know, far be it from me, about for 50, I would save the city. And then <laughs> Abraham says, How about if there are 40? How about if there, he keeps coming down. I heard an African-American preacher years ago preach on this, and that uh, after Abraham said, what if there are 50? And God responded by saying, names, Abraham. Give me names. <laughs> you think there must be 50, but let me have their names. So here, here Abraham, it's a prayer of a sort. He's interceding on behalf of people in a city, interceding on behalf of a city. Uh, that's interesting. In Genesis chapter 28, uh, you have the great moment where uh, Jacob is on the run from his brother, uh, and it's in all kinds of trouble. Everybody's annoyed with him. Uh, he's a real scoundrel. And he, um, that's 27, and he uh, falls asleep with a stone under his head, and he sees the angels ascending and descending. God speaks to him in a dream. So if we heard from God through a dream, is that part of what a prayer type relationship uh, might be? I love um, when Jacob awakes from his sleep. He says, surely the Lord is in this place, but I did not know it. Right? So I always wonder about when is God somewhere and you didn't realize it, you weren't asking for it, you didn't realize it until later. Is there something prayerful? Uh, in that, uh, that's interesting. Exodus chapter 3. Uh, Moses is uh, out in the wilderness. He doesn't seem to be praying or seeking God, but suddenly there's a bush. The bush is burning. He stops. He looks at it. He hears God call him uh, to do something really difficult. Uh, sometimes I wonder about, uh, we don't, I'm making assumptions. I wonder sometimes if our coldness in prayer, and I shouldn't assume you have coldness in prayer. You're probably white hot on prayer all the time. It's just absolutely so inspiring to you at every moment. But most people that I talk to have some struggles with prayer. It's, it's, a hard, it's hard to concentrate. It's hard to be disciplined or whatever. Uh, I wonder sometimes if, if some of that has to do with what we are expecting in prayer, because in Exodus chapter 3, uh, what we hear is God speaks to Moses from the bush, and he says what? I've heard the cries of my people. So God is a God who listens to the cries of people that are suffering, and then he calls Moses to go and do something about it, which would require courage, risk, 
sacrifice. So I wonder sometimes how often in our prayers we're actually asking God, what courageous thing do you want me to do? What uh, risky thing do you want me to do? What sacrificial thing are you asking of me? Uh, we tend uh, instead to ask uh, favor type things uh, from God. Uh, Exodus 33. See, we're going through the books of the Bible faster than you expected. Exodus chapter 33, we read that Moses spoke to God face to face the way that a man speaks with his friend. Uh, and we'd all love to have that. That may be the kind of thing, uh, the Bible seems to say that was like a special thing that was about safe to Moses, uh, not for everyone. Uh, God doesn't seem to give that to everyone. Over in 1 Samuel chapter 1, this is a great story. I mentioned this one when I did the Bible and marriage. There was a certain man of Ramatayim whose name was Elkanah. He had two wives, trouble already, already, right? Y'all with me? It's a funny line. It is trouble. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. The name of the other was Panina. Panina had children. Hannah had no children. And Panina would taunt Hannah. I have children and you don't. Terrible thing. Uh, so uh, Hannah would go to uh, the temple in Shiloh, and here's what we read about her prayer. She continued praying before the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. She was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. He asked her, how long will you be drunken? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I'm a woman sorely troubled. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink. I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Uh, she's praying for the one gift that she really wants, which would be a son. What happens rather remarkably, if you read on through 1 Samuel 1, 2, and 3, is God grants that prayer. She gets the son, and then what does she do with the son? I know Sarah Sumner knows this. She's always ahead of us. She, she, she asks for this child from God, and then when she gets the child, one would think she would cling to that child as who will be with her for the rest of her life and will care for her in her old age. But instead, having get, received her from the Lord, she gives him back to God to the service of God. There's something in biblical prayer around that is that whatever we receive from God, we really realize that it is God's, and how do we offer it uh, back to God? That's pretty interesting. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Not one of those books that people generally say they have read lately. Second Chronicles chapter 20 has a, a marvelous uh, moment. I thought about writing a book uh, around this. The Israelites are about to go into battle and they're pretty terrified and they come to Jehoshaphat who's the king and he too is pretty terrified. He offers the sacrifice uh, to God, and then in the hearing of all the people, he says, O oh Lord, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Like, that'd be like a great political leader in America. I have no idea what to do, but my eyes are upon the Lord. It's a fascinating prayer, right? Uh, the book of Job. We ought to do Job one day. Um, Job, uh, beginning in chapter 3 and running through most of chapter 31 for that long section, except for the times that his friends interrupt him, Job is, we could say, praying, and what he's really doing is he's talking to God. He's saying, let the day perish when I was born. May God above seek nothing but darkness for me. Let that night be barren that my mother gave birth to me. Uh, he's just cursing God over and over, over and over. Is that part of prayer is to rail against God, to curse God, to blame God for the troubles that we have. Jesus does this, of course, on the cross. Jesus doesn't say, oh Lord, thank you for bringing me to this moment of crucifixion. He quotes one of the Psalms, Psalm 22, which is, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's railing against God for the agony that he's having to go through. Uh, the Psalms are, with only a few exceptions, prayers 
uh, summer prayers that people would use when they would gather for worship. Psalm 24 uh, is sort of a digest of a worship service from ancient Israel, if you can imagine this. So to look at that psalm, it begins, the earth is the Lord's. I remember studying this in school, and it was just so enlightening to me. My professor, Roland Murphy, who's sort of the world's leading psalm scholar at the time, uh, he dissected the psalm and said, this opening is a hymn that the people would sing when they would gather for worship, be about to go into the temple, and they would stand outside, and someone would lead them in singing, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. <coughs> he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. And then there's a question and answer. So people outside wanting to enter through the gates of the temple would sing, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? And the priest would answer from inside, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, he who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of his salvation. The people respond by saying, such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob's. And then they speak to the gates. They're outside the temple. They want the gates to open so they can come in. So they sing, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. One side chants, who is the king of glory? The others answer, the Lord. It's like a responsive reading. The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Uh, I think often we think that we pray during worship. It might be interesting, though, to think of the entire worship service as prayer, as words that we offer up to God through our hymns of praise, through all that we do, even the sermon, if I think of my sermon as something that is prayerful, that is offered up, not to entertain you guys, the listeners, uh, but something that is uh, pleasing to God. Uh, in the Psalms, we have various types of Psalms that uh, evoke different moods. Some are Psalms of praise. Psalm, there's so many of them. Uh, Psalm 19, the heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech. Uh, praising the Lord for creation and then praising the Lord for his law. Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Um, I feel like after 21 years, I tell you things that I've told some of you before, but you probably forget, so I'll, I'll tell you anyway. I only know so many things. Um, Sometimes when pastors and I talk about worship, one of the things that... Um, uh, we believe is a, sort of a lost category in the spiritual life is praise. Uh, and you may have a bad image of praise, like, you know, I have a friend who's Pentecostal and they do, you know, whatever. Uh, but praise is simply a lauding God, praising God for who God is. That's tricky for us because we tend to think of what has God done for me. So we want to give thanks to God, but praising God is different. Uh, and my uh, illustration of this uh, that I remember from seminary days, uh, the dean of Duke Divinity School came by uh, yesterday and we visited a while and we got to talking about a professor of mine that he had been good friends with named David Steinmetz. And David Steinmetz taught us that St. Augustine, I had to look this up later, preached all these sermons on love. And Augustine is preaching in Latin to a Latin audience. And for Augustine, uh, he had to help them think through, there were two Latin words for love, udi and frui. Udi is love of use, right? So I could say, I love money. I don't want to put it on wallpaper. I, I don't want to sleep with it. I love money because I can use money for something else that I actually want, right? So love of use. There's Udi love, and then there's Frui love, which is the love of enjoyment. And uh, my illustration of that is I love chocolate. I, I just do. I'll do anything to get it. I just love it. I don't love it because of what it, what I use it for, right? Because what chocolate does is not like a healthy thing. It like adds to my waistline, cholesterol, and so on. So what Augustine tries to help people think about is that we too often tend to love God with a love of use. 
We think, I love God because I want to use God to help me get things that I want, for God to protect me, and so on, which God doesn't mind, but God actually wants us to love God with a love of enjoyment, with fruity love. We just love God because we just love God. If you think about people in your world that you love, uh, I love Lisa, and if I said, well, I love her because I can use her for some things I want, right? She gives me like a nice household, and it's going to make a great dinner tonight. I love her. <laughs> I'd be a little bit of a cad, right? Uh, Greg, be careful now with Amy there. Um, what, what Lisa wants is for me just to love her for who she is. So the Psalms of praise uh, help us to do this. They're Psalms of thanksgiving. And one of the amazing things uh, in the Psalms is when we see the word, give thanks to the Lord. Many Psalms begin this way, give thanks to the Lord. Uh, I remember my professor at Duke just blowing our minds one day by saying, the ancient Hebrew language has no equivalent for our word, thanks. Right? Like, we teach our children, say, thank you. And we're supposed to say thank you. And we're supposed to say thank you to God. He said there was no uh, equivalent of that. He said in Hebrew, and this actually is true, the word that gets translated thanks is a word toda, T-O-D-A-H. Toda, so when it says give thanks to the Lord, what a toda was, was a tangible sacrifice of something precious to you that you would offer up to God. So when the Bible says the Lord has been good, therefore give thanks to God, it's not just thank you. But you actually take something that is precious to you. If you're thankful uh, that your crop has come in, you take the first fruits of the crop and you offer it to God. If you're thankful that your flock of sheep are still thriving, you take the most precious sheep and you offer it up as a sacrifice to God. Like, I love that. There's something costly in it. You have some uh, skin in the game uh, when there's thanksgiving to God. Uh, many psalms are uh, in a category that we would call psalms of lament. These are psalms where we cry out to God in need. Uh, here's a little test case for you to tell me what's wrong with this psalmist. I'll, I'll give you two of them. So one is Psalm 69. Uh, psalm 69 says, O Lord, the waters have come up to my neck. So my question to you is, what is wrong with the person who created that psalm? If you're, a, if you're a literalist, right, you think, I jumped in the swimming pool at the deep end and I cannot swim, right? <laughs> the waters have come up to my neck. But yet it's probably a metaphor, right? The waters have come up to my neck, meaning what? It's um, figuratively, I'm about to drown, I've had too much, I'm about to go under, and so on. Uh, Psalm 6 uh, is a lovely one to think about. It says, O Lord, be gracious to me, for I am languishing. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. So what's wrong with somebody who says, my bones are troubled? I heard the word arthritis. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Could be. What, what else, though, could that be? Just my bones are troubled. My whole being is so troubled, and you, and you begin to feel it physically, like you be staggered. You know, I, just, uh, I love that. My bones are troubled. Arthritis. <clears throat> it's a prayer for everything uh, in the Bible. <clears throat> uh, one of the things that uh, we discover in the Psalms is that the people often prayed together as the people. We tend to think that prayer is an individual thing. You as an individual will pray to God, but so many of the Psalms are the people of Israel praying for the people of Israel, to be the people of Israel. And there's a lesson in that. When do we pray not just as individuals, but as the church? God asks us as a church to pray. God asks us as a church to listen to what God is uh, calling us uh, to do. Um, book of Jeremiah 
Jeremiah is a prophet. God calls him to be a prophet, and uh, nobody listens to him. People get angry at him. His own family abandons him. They're totally embarrassed because he's saying things that are unpopular. And instead of preaching smooth words that everyone will love, God's going to do wonderful things for us. Our troubles will be over tomorrow. Instead, Jeremiah says, we've sinned. We've broken God's heart. Things are going to go badly for us for quite some time. Uh, his, his family abandons him. Some people are physically abusive to him. So Jeremiah, who has spoken for God, then cries out to God in his agony. He says, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all who are treacherous thrive? Or do you know me? You see me. <laughs> How long must I mourn? How long will wickedness overcome me? And I love God's answer to Jeremiah in chapter 12, verse 5. Like, what, what do you expect God to say to Jeremiah, Jeremiah after crying out? Like, how long, O oh Lord? Why do I have to suffer so much? What do you expect God to say to him? I know it's hard to hear in here. Don't worry. It will get better. I will bless you soon. Here's some words of comfort. Uh, God's response to him is this. If you have raced with men on foot and they have wearied you, how will you compete with horses? Like, it's going to get harder, right? If you're tired now, just wait. Uh, not, not a helpful uh, response uh, on God's part. Let's go to uh, New Testament. Matthew. Chapter 6. So this is in the uh, midpoint of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is preaching, Matthew chapter 5 through 7. Jesus begins by saying, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you, you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Verse 5. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. You know, I personally, having been a Methodist pastor all these years, I've not seen many Methodists who have that problem. I remember as a kid going to, sorry, Southern Baptist Church with my grandfather and they would call on lay people to pray. And there were always a couple of these men. They would stand up and they would go on and on and on. Like, it's hot, no air conditioning. I'm bored. It's making me crazy. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. He says, but when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And in praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So pray like this, and then we have the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we can actually say it together, right? So, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. How is that just fundamentally different from the way we normally pray? It, uh, my answer to that is like in almost every way, right? So it's not, uh, there's, there's not much asking. What are the things that are asked for, if you will, in the Lord's Prayer? The one seems to be daily bread. So then we ask for forgiveness, which is hard in our world where we're taught, you know, I'm a pretty good person. Asking for forgiveness and it's a haunting ask for forgiveness. Why? 
Because it said, forgive us our trespasses as, right? So to the degree to which we forgive others. Ouch. Um, what else does it ask for? Toward the beginning, your will be done on earth as in heaven. I'm going to preach on that on Easter Sunday. Um, keep us from temptation, which we may have a part of to avoid places of temptation. Uh, what about hallowed be thy name? That, that, that's an ask about God's name. That's interesting. Or praying that God's kingdom come. It was Aldous Huxley wrote, uh, when we sing, when we pray, thy kingdom come, there's implied in that, my kingdom go. I always like that. Thy kingdom come, my kingdom uh, go. It's an interesting idea. Read over and over that Jesus goes to a lonely place. We read at the uh, end of the story on Maundy Thursday night after the Last Supper, Jesus goes out uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane uh, and he prays. Uh, so intently uh, that he's perspiring, he's shaking. It says that his uh, perspiration is like drops of blood. Uh, and what does he pray? You know this. What does Jesus pray there? He prays the, let this cup pass from me. I'd rather not go through this very difficult, painful, sacrificial, costly thing. But your will be done. Um, I will embrace um, whatever you uh, ask of me. I'm going to cover something else in Matthew chapter 6. So let me go back there for just a moment. Uh, after the Lord's Prayer, uh, Jesus uh, adds this that is haunting. For if you forgive men their tras trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive them their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Ouch, that's really serious. Um, in uh, Luke's version of that same thing, uh, oh, it's in 18. The saw behind me is making me crazy. Oh, we'll just keep going. So in John uh, chapter 16, verse 23. Jesus says, truly I say to you, if you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. If you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Is that true? You don't want to accuse Jesus of being wrong, of course. <laughs> What, what do you do with that? If you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will do it for you. It is true. But we have to interpret what is meant by in your name. The, the secret there is in your name. I'll never forget, uh, my girls never did this. When I said, here's how you pray, they just did it. Noah's always like, he had a hundred questions about everything. So when I said, you pray in Jesus' name, he said, why do we say in Jesus' name? His name's Jesus. So why don't we just say in Jesus? Instead of, I had no answer for this question. Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> so when it says to pray in Jesus' name, I don't think it's suggesting that that's the formula, that if you happen to say in Jesus' name, then up. Oh, God's on the hook, and God has to do it. This is a hugely problematical thing, though. Um, I've had um, many uh, privileged occasions to pray at uh, public events that are not Christian church events. And I always try to pray in an inclusive way, and especially used to get every year to uh, say a prayer at the Panthers game uh, when Mr. Richardson's still on the team, and I'd say a prayer. We'd get set in the box with them. It was great fun. So every year I would craft this prayer, and the Panthers have to approve the prayer, and uh, I would pray it, and all that week I would hear from people that I did not know, dinging me for my prayer, and you know what they were upset about? 
is that at the end of the prayer, I did not say, in Jesus' name, as if that would have made it a valid prayer. Not doing it made it evil somehow. Of course, when you pray in public, you're trying to include all people. They're Jewish fans. They're all kinds of people. And it's not like the in Jesus' name makes the prayer work and it wouldn't work otherwise. So if that's not the case, then what would it mean to pray in Jesus' name? That what? What were the things that Jesus himself prayed, which evidently um, wasn't um, favor based, right? (laughs) Jesus didn't seem to be asking God for lots of favors. He seemed to be offering himself to God, wanting to fulfill what God's will for him was. What else would it mean to pray in Jesus' name? I would say at least my thinking on it is that am I praying in sync with not just what Jesus prayed, but who Jesus was, all that Jesus was about. In my conversation with God, am I embracing uh, the things that Jesus was about through his actions and through his words? Uh, And that changes everything, doesn't it? Because in the same chapter where Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer and other things about prayer, uh, he has um, that section that says what? Do not lay up treasure on earth. So, oh, that's part of what it would mean to pray in Jesus' name is that I not lay up treasure on earth and, and many, many other things. Uh, fascinating to think about. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 8, there's stuff all through here. Uh, I'm always struck by this. Um, Romans chapter 8, beginning verse 14. All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of sonship when we cry, it's a prayer, evidently, Abba. Father, it is the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to come. The creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, for the creation is subject to futility. The creation itself will one day be set free from bondage to decay. We know that the whole creation has been groaning and travail together. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait for adoption as sons. Uh, Paul has this whole thing uh, about size being prayers. I brought this up during the pandemic and tried to share this with you guys a bunch of times. I heard a lot of people, everybody was, like uh, a side became interesting during the pandemic because you were emitting air that might be dangerous. But then also everybody was in some despair and they were tired and they didn't know what to do. So people, there was just a lot of sighing. And what Paul says in this passage is that when you sigh, it sounds like, looks like despair, but it's actually God's spirit praying in you. This kind of changes what prayer is. Prayer is just my life before God. And the whole parent-child relationship is interesting. That maybe prayer isn't like a machine. We ask God for favors. Does God do them or not? But we think of prayer as a relationship between God as parent and us as God's children. Uh, Lisa's mom was um, as stalwart a prayer as I have ever known in my life. And I heard her more than once uh, talk about her morning time with God. And she would call it her lap time. Uh, It's not that she had a book in her lap. So what she imagined was that she was like a child on her heavenly father's lap, just being together. I mean, I think about my kids being little and things I miss. I miss playing ball. I miss going to SeaWorld. I mean, I miss all these things. 
Uh, but if you press me, the thing that I miss the most are just times that we just were kind of together. Just sometimes my kids would come, they'd sit under my arm, and we'd just chill on the couch. I remember one night, Noah was especially upset. I think it was his first uh, heartbreak as a child. And he just put on my, his head on my shoulder, and he just cried for a long time. I just kind of hung on to him. To me, this is like a beautiful image of what prayer is, could be, uh, should be. Philippians chapter 4. Uh, I'm almost done. So I love this passage, and it's, for me, a great example of um, not just how to pray, but how to read the Bible and how to read the Bible slowly. Sometimes we read too fast, thinking it's like a novel. So in Philippians 4, verse 4, uh, Paul says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, like in case you missed it the first time, rejoice. What's your reaction to that? Paul says, rejoice, not now and then when things are going well, or you're in a happy mood. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. So God's love is a good cause to rejoice. Does anybody else feel like I do when I read rejoice always? I feel like, oh. In all things. Maybe he means find gratitude in whatever situation. So it's not giving thanks for the things. Sometimes I say, thank you, Lord, for this, but I sure don't like it. And and some of the things, if we think of a thing as everything we encounter in life, some of it's evil. Some of it is sinful. Some of it is so you don't thank God for the thing, right? But is there some growth in it? Is there... Anyway, it's kind of like piling on. Uh, Paul says, let all men know your forbearance. The Lord is at hand. Then you have this. Have no anxiety about anything. How does that make you feel? (laughs) I always think it's like piling on. Like I'm anxious and then God's telling me not to be anxious, which makes me more anxious. What does that mean? Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, Jan, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Now, that's the sentence that I think is worth reading slowly and unpacking. Have no anxiety about anything. That seems impossible. But in everything... By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. What Some of you heard me talk about this before, but what's odd about that? In a room where it's hard to hear. I'll tell you what I think is odd about that. It says, with thanksgiving, make your requests made known to God. I think I grew up thinking you make your requests known to God, and if God does what you ask, then if you remember, you give thanks to God, right, (laughs) for doing what you asked. But instead, Paul says, you make your request with thanksgiving, or you start with gratitude. And we get confused as Americans about gratitude because we're so affluent and we have so much, we give thanks for all kinds of things. I live in a nice house. I have a great job. I've got a big retirement nest egg. I'm healthy. I'm tall. I'm good looking, whatever. We give thanks for all those kinds of things. But these are passages that have spoken to the poorest people in the world through all of human history with no medical care and so on. It's just so interesting uh, to me. With gratitude, have no anxiety about anything, but, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Uh, and I'll repeat something that I know I've written on several times. Um, 
There's this connection between gratitude and anxiety. So I read, I reported on this in a couple of sermons. I read this uh, psychologist years ago named Martin Seligman. uh, And he wrote a book about gratitude. And he's not doing a theological thing at all. He's just talking about for human beings. And he talks about how they score people. They uh, give you a depression score. Everybody's got a little depression. Some people have more than others. They give you a depression score along a... a, um, Uh, There there are markers of how much depression you suffer or how much anxiety you suffer. Everybody's got some anxiety, but you get an anxiety score. He said, if you express gratitude, and not just a quick thought of gratitude, but you actually do something like, I write Linda a thank you note for singing in the choir. Linda, thank you for singing in the choir. That's such a great service to our church that you do this. Or I thank Mary Catherine for reading Scripture. Mary Catherine, thank you for reading Scripture in our worship service. It's so cool the way you read it, and people don't even want me to preach after you read the scripture, and thank you for, anyway. What Solomon says is that if you do that, if you're writing down, or at the end of the day, he says, make a list of five things that went well today, like write them down before you go to sleep. If you do this day by day, your anxiety score, it's not that you have no anxiety, but your anxiety score comes down. Your depression score comes down. If you just are in tangible ways expressing gratitude over and over. That's really interesting to me. And so I've tried a little test case in me, which is if I, that was a, Lisa's laughing out loud. If I feel anxious, that's actually a lot of the time for me, I have to admit, even in my sleep, right? Sometimes you get anxious in your sleep, right? You're having a dream about, oh my God. Something's going on. Uh, When I feel anxious, if I put the brakes on that and think, let me start expressing gratitude. So I start to write a thank you note or I type an email to somebody thanking them for something. I find in me, I, I cannot be anxious and grateful in the same moment. Now, maybe you can. And if you can, report that to me later because I'd like to learn about that. But I find for me, when I'm expressing gratitude, I'm not anxious at the same time. So I wonder if that's something. Paul says, have no anxiety. Well, maybe he's not just saying, don't be anxious. Maybe he's about to explain how to diminish your anxiety in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And then he describes what I think is the result of that. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. All right. We got construction going on. Um, I had some other stuff to try to uh, ramble through. It's hard to hear. What, what would y'all want to ask or, or talk about while we're together on this subject? Bert. I have a question. Basically, prayer is two things. Asking for thanking God for answering that prayer. Is that correct? So Bert says prayer is two things, asking for and thanking for. I would argue that's a C.S. Lewis in saying this prayer work would say those are a small part of prayer. Well, I meant those are the things that people ask for things and then they thank God for those things as opposed to the conversation So I know you can't hear it, Bert, but he's saying it should be a conversation that we have regularly. Something, uh, I've, I did this in a sermon one time, I got blank looks, but I still think I'm on to something, is uh, if you try to use the verb pray, you inevitably will add the word for. It's hard to think of pray without for, but I wonder if there isn't prayer that doesn't have a for after it. Like, I want to be prayerful, I want to pray, which might mean it's just quiet time with God. What is Psalm 46, that could be part of our prayer thing, says what? Talk a lot to God and tell God the stuff that you want. No, it says, be still, be still, and know that I am God. The Psalms over and over talk about knowing God in silence. 
It doesn't mean that you know, you think your request instead of saying them out loud. There's something about the stillness, the quiet. So I have as a goal for me is to be more of a person who prays but doesn't have to have the four after it. Because when I do that, it's less about me and it's more about God, or it's less about me and it's more about us. I'm trying to work on the same thing with the verb hope. If I say hope, you add a for to it. I hope for health. I hope for old age. I hope for, I mean, whatever it is that you hope for. But I wonder, is there's a way just to be, just to hope, just to be a hopeful person? I'm a person of hope. I don't really know what the outcome will be. I'm not sure if I had a desired outcome, if that would actually be the best outcome. So maybe if I trust God, I can be a person who simply hopes. Maybe. Jan. You know, you say, you said this many times, that prayer is a relationship. You hope. We hope. What? We hope. It's a relationship. Yeah. So, so there are people, we know them, who they've heard God's voice. I would not be one of them. I've never heard a voice that I could identify as being God's voice. But I would say God has spoken to me, not by a voice that I've heard, but in so many other ways. So I find the way, one of the ways God, if you think about it during Bible time, I did a paper on this a long time ago. How many times does God do something amazing like speak to people or work a miracle in the Bible and you add up how many times that is and then divide it by the number of years that are recounted in the Bible? And it turns out on that, God does something amazing about every 17 years. So it's not like God is just chattering all the time with all the people and there was a miracle just at every turn, right? So with that, for me... The way I think I hear God speaking back to me is in a lot of ways. One is through Bible. I try to listen to that, be attentive to that. When I'm in worship, we sing a hymn. I try to think of that as one of the ways that God responds in the conversation. Um, I've said before, I think the uh, hurts of other people and the news of the world is God saying, here's something that's breaking my heart. Does that break your heart? Is there anything you might be interested in doing about that? Sort of odd way to think of God's calling, God uh, speaking. Uh, And sometimes I try to think, I mean, I feel the same thing. Prayer for me is really, really hard, and I have to really, really work at it. And it's hard for me to concentrate. My mind wanders. So sometimes it feels like it's this one-sided thing. But I did think one time, if I could somehow reverse all of that and ask, how does my praying feel to God? How does my spiritual life feel to God? I just had the suspicion that God would say, this feels awfully one-sided, right? I'm surrounding this person with so much love, with so much comfort, with so much grace, and this person pays so little attention to me. But I I don't know that. So it's a valid question. That's Reinhold, I didn't think of it, that's Reinhold Niebuhr's idea, is that we tend to beat ourselves up if we get distracted in prayer, but if you get distracted in prayer, 
that's obviously something that is of concern to you, and it will be to God. So just like shift your prayer over there from where you were. Yeah. James, uh, on the evening news every night, we hear about all of these terrible things going on in Hamas. And if we just think about it, is God listening to us? Do we have to ask God? But again, I, I think uh, prayer to me, prayer is, it doesn't have to have the four. So if I see what's happening in Gaza, and it's the old thing, let your heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. I can get annoyed and say, Joe Biden ought to do something or whatever I could do. But just for, to begin though with how does God feel seeing this go on and it's got to be more devastating to God than to us. God sees it all. God hears every child's pain, hunger, all of that. So God's devastated by this. So part of prayer, I would say, is being close enough to God that I, I will share in how you feel about this. We tend to respond to things politically and with anger or fear. Right? Something's going on in Gaza. Joe Biden should do something. So what's going on in America, the Republicans should do something. So everybody's just mad all the time about everybody. Versus asking kind of larger questions, which is, okay, what's, what are God's thoughts on this? Which I think we can know. What is God asking not just me to do, but maybe us to do? Um, I mean, I've said this thing before. It, it never gets traction. <laughs> But things like people complain about uh, whatever they complain about, violence and sex on TV and in movies. And we go, oh, we gripe about it. But the fact is, if all the Christians in America said, we will not watch anything with that. If I'm in a movie theater and there's a shooting, I'm going for the exit. TV show comes on, there's a murder, I'm going to turn the TV off. If all the Christians in America did that, there would be no shooting on TV. But we have a taste for it. We keep watching it like everybody else. So anyway, so how do we think about? And sometimes it's just hard because what God would ask isn't what our politics favors. Which is a whole other problem. But anyway, um, it's got to be noon right? And it's getting louder out there. I apologize for that. It's progress. That's what I always tell Lisa when a building gets torn down or a building, and like, yeah, it's progress. Anyhow, thank you all for coming. And uh, we'll regroup in a couple of weeks, not during Holy Week, but uh, April 3rd. So. So, so Bert's doing Garth Brooks, which is God answers all prayers, but not the way you want. And that's a, that may be true. The Bible never says that. It seems like a nice idea, but it's not a Bible thing. It's a Garth Brooks thing, but it's just who came and worked on our Habitat project, right? So you have to love Garth Brooks, right? Thank you all.